But yeah, nice to meet you guys. I'm Katie. I'm your host today for our webinar. And I'm a solutions consultant here at Central Reach. I have been here for two and a half years, a little bit over that. I work with our scheduling tools and our data tools, and I really work with organizations with optimizing their practice when it comes to scheduling and their outcomes. So I really enjoy my job. I get to talk to a lot of organizations about how they schedule, and I'm excited today to talk with you guys about really the kind of basics of scheduling, how to set you guys up for success with your schedule. So with that in mind, we're going to get through some quick housekeeping. So we do have, you may notice the chat closed today. So I request that you use the Q&A button. That should be at the bottom of your Zoom bar. That will help us make sure that we see all the questions that come in. It allows us to either answer them live on the call or maybe through the chat. I have my friend Andrea here who might be helping answer some of those questions as they come in. So that just helps us ensure we don't miss anything. So thank you for using that. We will have a, a few minutes for some Q&A at the end, if time allows. We will also be following up with a recording of this webinar. Please just give us about two to three business days for that video to process, and, and that should be sent to your email. All right, getting into it. So yeah, welcome. Thanks for coming today. Today, we're really going to kick off a conversation when it comes to scheduling, scheduling workflows, best practices. This will be the first webinar in a series. So we're really going to hit on the foundations today. So we're going to talk about foundations for success in your business and your schedule the elements of a schedule and scheduling maintenance. And like I mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Let's get in to the meat of today. We're going to talk about foundations for success at first. So before we even talk about how to set the schedule up for success, I do just want to acknowledge that scheduling is really foundational to the success of your practice. I think we probably have a lot of schedulers here today, and, and I'm sure most of you guys agree. But of course, I just want to emphasize that scheduling is going to be driving a lot of your KPIs, your key performance indicators, and scheduling will either limit or allow you to expand on your performance and your goals. I'm going to give a couple examples here, but I, I think you guys probably are with me. First example is going to be with auth utilization, right? Of course, if your goal is to reach 80% of your auth utilization, you will never be able to reach it if you're only scheduling 75 or even 80% of authorized hours because of cancellations that are just bound to happen, right? It's also going to open opportunities for cutting back on non-billable hours. That starts with the schedule. Are we optimizing for travel time? Do we have a good contingency plan for cancellations? Revenue of your business is going to be expanded and limited by the schedule as well. Of course, the first step to increase revenue will be to schedule as many of the authorized hours as possible and to get new clients scheduled quickly. Again, I'm sure you're sensing a trend here, but scheduling may also affect staff satisfaction and retention. We want to make sure our staff are being offered enough hours and that they're being offered a sense of consistency. I can find that constant tweaks to the schedule can leave staff feeling unprepared for their day. So we want to make sure we're balancing consistency and flexibility with that in mind. So, since scheduling is really the foundation of your practice, right? How do we set up your scheduler and therefore your schedule for success? I just wanna start off by saying there's no right way to schedule. I think the only right way is the one that allows you to reach your desired outcomes. 
With that in mind, I do just want to emphasize that your priorities and goals should be clearly communicated to schedulers and consideration should be taken into how they may be able to encourage success towards your goals via their approach to scheduling. I talked to a lot of Central Reach customers, like I mentioned earlier, about how they approach scheduling. And I just want to say that so far, not one customer has scheduled exactly the same. So I really encourage you to keep your unique practice in mind while we're talking today. So some considerations include who is responsible for different scheduling activities. And like I mentioned, it might be different with different organizations, your priorities, your goals, how you're structured. But of course, with that in mind, we wanna know if it's their main duty, or if they have others. If they have other duties, where do scheduling activities fit in? So we generally see one of two approaches here, either a centralized or a decentralized approach to scheduling. There's definitely pros and cons of both. The pros of a decentralized are for sure the ability to run lean. Um, ownership over one's day for that clinician and of course flexibility for clinicians and clients when it comes to cancellations and reschedules. However, some cons that come in is that you may be more likely to have disjointed or mismatching workflows when we have clinicians schedule themselves, as well as leading to less accuracy and visibility of your KPIs and the ability to respond to issues that may be affecting your KPIs. This can also affect scheduling consistency depending on your staff, your clients, and it just may result in lower client satisfaction. One more con here is that breaking up the responsibility can impede a good bird's eye view of the schedule. And clinicians may feel one or two cancellations are not a big deal when they might there might be larger trends at play. Now, the other approach, a centralized approach, would be where we have an individual or a team of individuals whose main job is scheduling. So pros here are going to be, we have streamlined workflows that can lead to greater efficiency, clear data and insights, ability to identify and respond to issues quickly, and clear expectations and communications with clients. Our cons here are going to be that, of course, it can be more costly um, and that you schedulers, depending on how you approach this, may not have a good concept of variables affecting life in the field and a schedule that feels good to clinical staff. To combat some of those cons, we see some organizations choose to involve only dedicated schedulers in that centralized approach, or they may choose to include clinical team involvement. Of course, those dedicated schedulers, they're more likely to have an unbiased approach like we mentioned. However, they might not know that day in the life, they might not know the best clinical fits. For that reason, organizations may choose to have schedulers shadow a clinician to experience that day in a life. And I've also seen organizations involve clinical team members in the final approval of a schedule, allowing for tweaks focused on positive client outcomes and staff satisfaction. No matter your approach, collaboration here is going to be crucial. Schedulers and behavior analysts should maintain open communication channels to discuss scheduling preferences, any changes in the client's needs, updates to the treatment plans. I really think that a collaborative approach, no matter how you choose to schedule, really ensures that the scheduling aligns with the overall goals of the ABA program and ensures good outcomes for our clients. Another piece we want to talk about here is managing the number and type of clients and providers that you have. That will really set up your scheduler for success. It's, of course, healthy to keep that healthy balance, right, of clients that require different levels of energy and skills, along with staff with different strengths and interests. Like we mentioned earlier, your schedule can definitely impact staff retention, and this is a really good way to positively impact that. Last point here we have is a contingency plan. So I definitely want to talk a little bit more about that because of course, even with the best schedule, 
your cancellations will occur and changes will need to be made. We'll discuss a little bit more about it later. So we'll go ahead and move on, but definitely keep that in mind when we're talking about all the different aspects of our schedule. One last foundation for success is going to be implementing structure, policies, and procedures. These will be what keeps your schedule running smoothly. We wanna make sure that staff involved in the scheduling practice have clear duties, workflows, and expectations. And consistent workflows will really allow for better reporting and clear insight to any issues that your schedule is facing. These are also going to allow for flexibility. If you have a change in your scheduling staff or people go on PTO, as we do, we want to make sure that those workflows are documented and available in a central location for any necessary staff to step in. Just like they should be clearly documented for people to step in, we also want to make sure that they're communicated and readily available for clients and staff. This is going to prevent any unpleasant surprises for both staff and clients. And I find this can really be where there's some tension in the scheduling process is when there's any surprises. So we want to set very clear expectations around availability, how that should be communicated, when it's appropriate to update it. On the flip side, when we might ask for more flexible availability from our staff or clients. We also want to set pretty clear expectations on plan timed off for staff. So do we offer PTO, unpaid time off? How is this accrued? Is it guaranteed? Are there limits? And how much advance notice are they expected to give the scheduler? For clients as well, we wanna make sure that we're clear there. Are clients expected to give advance notice for planned or extended time away? And if they have it, this, is there, maybe it's really an extended leave, is their spot saved for when they come back or will they be put back on the wait list? What does that look like, right? We have very clear expectations around these. Cancellations. This is a big part of your contingency plan, right? We always want to plan and anticipate for cancellations want to have those expectations around what's acceptable, and we need to have workflows for navigating those cancellations. Those workflows should be communicated again clearly to all clients and all staff. They can really throw off a provider's day or a client's day, especially for clients who may find it difficult with change. So again, things we want to keep in mind, who should they be communicated to and how, how much notice is required, what happens when there's a no-show or a late cancel? Some organizations may choose to implement a late cancel fee. Some organizations may choose to still pay staff for their time if there is a no-show or a late cancel. Again, all variables that you want to consider when you're setting up your structure and your policies to set your scheduler and your schedule up for success. Another piece of cancellations, we wanna make sure that not only do we know the expectations, but we know the next steps that were to happen if those expectations were surpassed. Another piece of cancellations is makeup sessions. Is that something you offer? And if that is something you offer, we need to make sure that we're scheduling in alignment with the different funding sources that you work with. Some payers may allow hours to be made up from previous months, while others may not. So we definitely need to keep a clear eye on this to avoid denials. Coverage is something we want to also keep in mind when it comes to cancellations and your contingency plan. We want to communicate with clients clear expectations before this happens as to whether we will provide coverage, when it would be communicated by, if they get final say on if they will see an alternate provider or not. Some people may choose to have a team of providers that are trained for that client and only provide coverage within that team. Others may open it up to other providers who are clinically fit. So definitely keeping clear expectations on this just allows to limit confusion and, and make everyone happier, keep them all on the same page. Wait list is definitely something that can affect our schedule as well. So we wanna keep structure around this. 
So how is this managed? What visibility do clients have? What is the process for moving from the wait list to receiving services? Last thing to keep in mind here is we want to always practice planned abandonment. So this is going to be essentially constantly keeping an eye on workflow efficiencies and reviewing them regularly. We want to make sure that guidelines and practices still make sense and offer value. What function do they serve? I'm gonna mention this a couple of times, but today I really want you guys to get curious about your schedule, move creatively in your decision-making and always adapt. So we'll go on briefly to kind of the elements of a schedule. As we explore these, I really encourage you to keep the foundational concepts of how we approach scheduling in mind. So first, the what, right? What services are we scheduling? In ABA alone, there are many services that may be scheduled, assessments, direct therapy, group therapy, supervision, parent training. And there's also a growing trend in our industry to offer multidisciplinary services as well. So you may choose to take the same centralized or de decentralized approach for all services, or you may mix it up. For example, you see it's common to have BCBA schedule their own supervision sessions after a scheduler has already created a direct schedule. Parent training is something interesting to think about here. How can we get creative with this? It's definitely an underutilized service code. So maybe you can offer parent training sessions to clients on the wait list who already have authorizations, right? that may be able to offer support and tee them up for success while they wait for direct services. That's just an idea, but really thinking creatively here is going to allow you to really reach your goals and new horizons that you wouldn't expect. Always be mindful, of course, when we're thinking about what schedules or services we're scheduling, be mindful of your funding source guidelines. Aware. This is a big piece too. So where do those services take place? This may be determined by your service model, or if your service model is flexible, the goals outlined in the treatment plan may guide where the sessions take place. Of course, it may be more natural to teach activities of daily living and self-care in the house, and it may be beneficial to teach social skills in a clinic with a variety of peers available. So with that in mind, if you do have a more flexible service model, definitely maintain clear communication channels between clinicians and schedulers so that you can be flexible with where you're offering your sessions. And of course, when, we'll hit on that a little bit later. These different service locations, of course, will introduce different variables. So we are going to be thinking about room capacity for in-clinic scheduling. In the community, we may be considering travel time and how do we look at this? How do we optimize for this? These are all going to shape the way you organize your data for scheduling and the way that you look at that bigger picture. The when. So when do we offer sessions? Of course, an individual client's duration of their sessions may vary. It's generally between one to three hours, I'd say in ABA, but definitely it can be flexible within that. In school settings, maybe we're offering them for longer. This really will be determined on the client with the behavior analyst, um, but we also may see that it's easier to set blocks for expectations of sessions. So keep open, again, you're gonna notice a trend here, but keep communication opens your channels open with your clinicians and your scheduler to find a good fit with consistency in that scheduling process, as well as clinical fitness. We wanna make sure we're also establishing any blackout dates and communicating them early. The who, so who can work together? I think this was the piece that you guys are having the least difficulty with, which is great. Um, I find this can be the most variable part of the schedule. It really is going to depend on the services being scheduled and the frequency and duration of the sessions, but you may choose a single therapist approach or a multi-therapist approach. Of course, that multi-therapist approach will allow for generalization of skills and reduce client and staff burnout. I've also seen organizations take either kind of a client-specific teams approach or a 
supervisor team approach to making those pairings. That client-specific approach is going to allow for a more tailored team and the most possibilities when considering different session off offerings. Now, of course, that supervisor team approach has benefits as well. It allows for more clarity and direct oversight and mentoring opportunities for staff. It can definitely make scheduling easier by breaking down the tasks into smaller groups and can limit, on the flip side, opportunities for different session offerings. Again, no matter the approach, you wanna keep in mind restrictions versus preferences. Restrictions should be clearly communicated and maintained. So whether they're based on payer requirements, clinical fitness or ethical considerations, and those preferences will really allow for consistency in the schedule and give the scheduler a place to start. Once you have that base schedule created, it's going to make maintaining that schedule and auditing that schedule easier. So this is where your policies and procedures will really shine and they'll allow you to maintain consistency in the maintenance of your schedule. So your workflows should allow for daily updates to be completed efficiently and promptly. This is probably the majority of every scheduler's job. It's just the ever-changing puzzle pieces, right? And as long as they're able to complete their job efficiently and promptly, that's going to flow into all areas of your business. So whether that's writing session notes, creating billing entries, submitting timesheets for payroll, right? It's all connected back to the schedule. This is also going to include implementing your contingency plan for cancellations and schedule changes. I would love to dive more on this. At a later time, we have such a short amount of time to get today, but with a well thought out and executed contingency plan, we can really offer flexible consistency for all clients and staff and find that balance. When implementing that plan, we wanna make sure, I, I know I've mentioned this before, we wanna make sure we're maintaining open lines of communication with staff and clients when we're addressing any unforeseen changes promptly and compassionately. Now, ideally, right, changes to the base schedule should be limited, but they are always inevitable. A big contributing factor here outside of those cancellations are going to be onboarding and offboarding of new staff and clients. Of course, that can be minimized a bit by our structure, that base schedule, the quality of that schedule. But of course, people move on, clients may no longer need services, life happens, right? So we wanna make sure that we have structure in how we're onboarding and offboarding new clients and staff. Some people may choose to onboard new staff or clients in batches around seasonal changes to the base schedule. Other times it may be needed mid-year. I find when you can do this in batches, it can be a little bit more streamlined with your goals and that base schedule overall. No matter the change that's happening, we wanna make sure that your policies and procedures set you up for success and guide you on the best next steps. I've said it before today, but practice planned abandonment. Be sure to audit these policies and procedures regularly. We want to really encourage excellence with our schedule. So I'll say it one more time, get curious, have some fun with it and always, always adapt your schedule so that we can meet our business goals and our client and staff needs. All right, I know that was a lot of info, but we do have some time for a Q&A. Looks like Andrea has answered some questions here. I'm gonna take a look. All right. Okay, we definitely have some specific questions on central reach scheduling with our tool. I, I wanna stay away from really talking too much about using central reach to schedule today. Because I, I wanna talk more about the themes around scheduling, but I definitely see this as an opportunity to dive more into using technology to schedule and 
and of course, Central Reach, using Central Reach to schedule. So I definitely love to cover that a bit more in our, in our next few sessions. I have a question here around managing conflict or disagreements between therapists and clients. I think that's an interesting question. Um, definitely can be a role that schedulers may find themselves in, that mediator role. So I just encourage proactive communication in that conflict resolution. Again, fostering that environment where concerns can be openly discussed and tactfully addressed before any issues may arise. Those policies and procedures are really gonna help you with success from this and prevent anything from getting too heated, right? Again, we wanna take that compassionate approach. We wanna hear each side without really airing grievances. And ideally we wanna swiftly resolve those issues with as little disruption to services as possible. That may mean reminders around expectations, setting up new boundaries, or even making a change mid-season, of course. Sorry, I'm reading through your questions here. How will we know when subsequent parts of this webinar will take place? I have questions regarding using Central Reach specifically as well. So we will definitely keep you guys informed on subsequent parts of this webinar for specific questions. Definitely reach out to your customer success lead and your account manager. They really are, if you're a Central Reach customer, they are um, your, your main source for how to, how to use Central Reach successfully. Um, let's see. Some questions around typical schedule blocks that organizations use. It's a great question. Unfortunately, I think I have to say that there's nothing really typical. It's definitely going to be based around your scheduling needs. Um, I'd say that those longer blocks, this customer, or this, uh, sorry, user, said that they are open really long. So they're open from like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'm usually finding if they're open for that long, they're breaking up the day into shorter blocks. Some organizations break them up very specifically. So for example, an eight to 10 block, like I said, I generally see those, the lengths of sessions being anywhere from one to three hours, sometimes four, really anything over five, I've generally seen as something that can be more difficult for staff to handle, but that's where I generally see the sweet spot of those blocks. And whether those blocks are set or flexible, that's really going to be based on if you have a break for the lunch and meal periods or not, or if you need to be providing coverage during those. Okay, I know we are right at time. I know there are some questions that I was not able to answer. So we will be reviewing those after today's call and we will be following up with you all. But I just wanna thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, I, I really appreciate having this conversation in this space with you guys where we can talk about really setting our practices up for excellence, setting our families that we're working with up for the best outcomes. And it's really encouraging for me, really exciting. So again, thank you so much for attending.